Hello everybody. Um, so this is going to be uh, session two. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, human evolution. Uh, but before that, uh, I ag again want to go back to health and wellness. You know, uh, what is holistic health and what is wellness? And then I will uh, kind of touch base a little bit about uh, human evolution, how old uh, our uh, ancestors are, uh, you know, uh, millions of years. Uh, it, it's important to understand how we evolved. So, uh, holistic health. So, what is holistic health? Holistic health, basically holism, uh, it has its origin uh, in the Greek word holos, which means whole. Okay. Uh, it was first used in 1926 by Jan Smuts uh, in his book Holism and Evolution. Okay. What has happened, like if you go to a medical doctor and, uh, you know, whenever there is any issue, you know, your uh, family physician will t send you either to neurologist or to uh, dermatologist, skin specialist or to, you know, uh, lung specialist. There is always like a super specialization, right? So this, uh, you know, this advance uh, in science, medical science, has led to silos. Silos means uh, every uh, organ doctor is working uh, separately in silos, uh, uh, individually, rather than treating body as a whole. Okay, so the super specialization of scientific discipline has created a silos mentality. Okay, so what it what it has led to is it has led to very myopic understanding of knowledge. Uh, and it, compromise, it compromises our ability to deal with the most obstinate problems. So whenever, you, uh, if anybody has any disease, it's just not one organ which gets affected. You know, by and large, there is the whole body which is involved, okay? So in uh, holistic health, you know, when you go to a doctor who takes care of holistic health, uh, they deal with the person as a whole and not just one organ, not just brain or kidney or liver or lungs, you know. Uh, it works on the root cause of the problem. Uh, and by and large, those root cause has uh, repercussion in, on each and every part of a body. Uh, so holistic health typically considers whole person and that whole person includes your body, your mind and your spirit. So here, you know, we will be learning uh, of, on a holistic approach of human health, which would be your, uh, you know, physical health, your mind, your mental uh, capacity, mind and your spirit. Okay. Now, holistic approach to healing goes beyond just eliminating symptoms. So it's not just, you know, okay, you got a headache, I gave you some uh, paracetamol and your headache goes away. You know, it's not, it's not that, it's not just eliminating symptoms, it's treating the cause, okay. Uh, the philosophy of a health in a hand is practiced as uh, Swarthavitta. Uh, so, if you look at, uh, you know, our culture, Ayurveda culture, you know, uh, we, uh, Ayurveda is all about uh, holistic uh, health. In contrast to contemporary model of outsourced healthcare, uh, Ayurveda and yoga actually advance in, in sourcing of healthcare, okay. So, it actually basically uh, recognizing the body type, uh, different, uh, you know, uh, I can now would say modality and then it works on uh, internally, uh, it's not outsourced. Uh, Ayurveda empowers individual to know their strength, limitations, inclinations and proneness to diseases and to carry out continuous self-assessment. Uh, in recent time, contemporary medicine has incorporated functional medicine. Uh, so especially in uh, developed world like uh, US, uh, we do have functional medicine doctors and they, uh, you know, they basically uh, encompasses the holistic health uh, and treat, not, uh, treat the root cause and not just the symptoms, you know. So this is important to understand that what is how holistic health. Uh, what is wellness? Now, wellness is a, a conscious, deliberate process that requires a person to become aware and make choices for a more satisfying lifestyle, okay? So here what happens when you go to a doctor for some disease, uh, doctor will say, take this medicine, do this, uh, and you know, uh, it will give you some medicine to suppress those symptoms. Uh, when it comes to wellness model, wellness model is something which, with, in which individual make a decision on their own to 
be in a good state of health okay so that you don't need to go to doctors for uh, you don't get diseases so, so that you need doctors uh, to take care of the diseases it's more of how you live your life so that you stay healthy okay uh, a wellness lifestyle includes balance of healthy habits such as adequate sleep rest productivity exercise participation in meaningful activity uh, nutrition social contacts uh, and supported relationship so this all encompasses the wellness approach uh, wellness is holistic and multi -dimension, dimensional and it includes physical emotional intellectual social environmental and spiritual dimensions okay so these are all the different dimensions that wellness uh, kind of encompasses uh, again, coming back to uh, you know one of the slide that which I have prepared that uh, what includes wellness. So first is your physical, of course, uh, physical health uh, is very important, uh, and that physical health also includes nutrition, what kind of food you're eating, uh, then your emotional health. Uh, emotional health is again you know what kind of uh, emotions that you are uh, you know or how you're reacting to the situation. Okay, so you want to have a in a very good emotional health so that you don't react to the situation. You respond to uh, you know uh, to any situation which are not uh, very uh, you know which are not necessarily uh, happy. Okay, so that is also your uh, emotional uh, well-being is very important uh, to be well. Uh, spiritual health is also very important. Uh, spirituality is not same as uh, religion. Uh, I will touch base a little bit on spirituality also if I get time. Uh, but spiritual wellness is also as important. Uh, intellectual wellness, whatever that you are learning, whatever cognition, whatever uh, cognitive uh, learning that you are doing in the class or even in your life, how you want to use that uh, learning for betterment of others, uh, not just for uh, our own self or our immediate family members, but also for the society in general. So that uh, intellectual wellness is very important. Uh, environmental, of course, uh, environment is the part of us, you know, uh, if we are in a happy environment, uh, definitely that wellness part will come in. But here, uh, environment also plays a role in terms of uh, spirituality. So, uh, you know, that basically uh, spirituality, environmental uh, uh, kind of goes hand in hand. Uh, social aspect, uh, of course, you you're surrounded by friends, family members, social support, uh, is important uh, as part of the wellness but at the same time uh, you know you want to make sure that you're not dependent uh, too much on others uh, you want to have that uh, wellness uh, in your hand so more you're dependent on others to feel happy uh, more uh, vulnerable that uh, we are we are becoming you know uh, financial wellness is important of course uh, you know as all of us are uh, you know uh, you know, our goal is to achieve uh, well, uh, not just, you know, uh, an other aspect, but also financially. Uh, occupational wellness is also very important, whether whatever we are doing, we are enjoying uh, it or not, you know, so that occupational wellness is as important. So, uh, uh, these are all the different uh, approach to wellnesses. Uh, I will try to touch uh, on few of them, not all of them, uh, but just uh, it's important to understand. Now, uh, what are the differences between medical model and wellness approach? Okay, uh, I'm not here to kind of uh, to teach you guys the medical approach. Of course, we have doctors for that. Um, I'll be focusing more on wellness approach. So, in medical model, uh, it's basically the this particular model is uh, very narrowly focused on illnesses. Uh, on symptom reduction, uh, rapid stabilization. If you have any problem, you go to doctor, they'll fix it. They'll fix the symptoms and you're, you're done with it. You come home, right? Uh, and it is intervention focused on deficiency and uh, incapacity, okay? Uh, while in wellness approach, wellness centers on health, okay? How to get you into the good uh, 
uh, health, uh, which I have discussed, uh, you know, in my previous slide. What is what is health? Uh, so it focuses on health, not on diseases. Uh, in the medical model, in the it is deficit-based approach. Individuals are seen in terms of the illnesses. So you know, whenever you go to a doctor, a doctor will say, "This is my patient. Patient has this patient." So you know, in medical approach, we are always considered as uh, patients. You know, uh, that patients is as per your illnesses. So this is my heart patient. This is my kidney patient. This is my lung patient. You know. So if you if you look at the lingo of doctors, uh, you know, uh, not in front of you, but when they are discussing, uh, you know, cases, we always discuss in terms of illnesses of the patient, like a kidney patient, a cardiovascular disease, or you know, heart patient. Um, in wellness approach, a person is empowered to assume personal responsibility. So in this wellness approach, person takes responsibility on their own uh, to be proactive in preservation of uh, his or her own health. Okay. Uh, in medical model, uh, people's interests, skills, abilities and potential to achieve personal goals are often overlooked. Okay, so what happens is like, you know, when you go to doctors, again, doctors will not ask what are your goals in life? Okay, uh, what are your interests? Uh, what interests you? Or what are your hobbies? Still, each, you know, doctors don't have time for this. So they are not interested in what, what your day-to-day uh, -day life is, you know, approach is very much fear based. Doctor will say, if you don't take this medicine, you will die of heart attack. Or if you don't take this medicine, you'll die of, uh, you know, diabetes. So you die of kidney failure, right? So the medical approach is very much fear-based, okay? Uh, and it, that fear-based approach can have a negative physiological or psychological effect on the body. Uh, this may compromise the interaction and deter positive change and healing. Okay, so again, that's the difference between your uh, medical uh, model and wellness model. Uh, here in wellness approach, when you approach the uh, person who is dealing with wellness, uh, they identify your goals, uh, preferences, interest, strength of the individual. So wellness and, and gender, a positive attitude. And this perspective sparks internal motivation. So there is intrinsic motivation in people who follow the wellness path. Okay, so it's up to you now you want to follow the medical uh, path or medical approach or medical model path or you want to approach the wellness approach path. Okay, and uh, this intrinsic motivation strengthens our optimistic attitude. So, you know, when we are eating right food, when we are exercising, when we are sleeping right, when you are uh, meditating, then you are, uh, that the confidence which comes from within is just completely different. Okay, uh, and it, that, opt that attitude is very, very optimistic. You know, you're always thinking positive that, you know, uh, if, I, if I sleep well, you know, I'll, I'll get up with fresh mind, I'll be able to do better. So all that, you know, it's always very, very optimistic. The narrow focus on limitations of often exacerbate mental illness or crisis rather than supporting recovery. Okay, so again, you know, when uh, when a doctor says that uh, you know you you can die of heart disease if you don't do this, uh, again, it has effect on mental illness. You always kind of in fear that uh, oh, if I don't do this, this will happen. Okay, uh, while in wellness approach, individual is empowered to manage life crises and stresses and direct their attention to wellness lifestyle goal. Uh, in medical model, it diagnoses the uh, embracement of spiritual dimension as a form of pathology, uh, sham shamanism, ritualistic behavior, and quackery. Okay, so again, uh, you know what happens in medical model is that uh, whenever somebody talks about the spirituality or you know um, any of those, then doctors kind of feel that this person is weird. You know, so it's not taken very in a very positive aspect, uh, unfortunately, in medicine. Uh, in wellness approach, spirituality is considered as a strength. Okay, uh, through its value as a contribution to health and healing. So that's a major difference between medical approach and uh, wellness approach, where uh, spirituality is not considered as positive uh, as much, or it's not given due consideration in medical approach. 
Um, now I'm going to talk about uh, human evolution. Okay, so in uh, this is again part of my second lecture, second session. Uh, now before I go into cell biology, uh, we need to understand our evolution. Okay, and how far. Uh, you know, in past that, uh, like how we evolved over millions of years. Okay, so here is uh, one uh, diagram that you can see. The first picture that you see over here, uh, that is basically Australopithecus uh, afarensis. Uh, you can see that you know uh, this one uh, definitely looks like ape, but uh, walking on it ha walks on two feet. Uh, after then came Homo. Uh, habilis, okay, the height has become shortened. Uh, after that, you see Homo erectus, the third one, much taller, uh, as tall as the latest hum Homo sapiens, okay. Uh, you can see the structure of uh, brain and you know, you know, the just overall uh, shape of brain and face is also changing. Uh, after that is Homo neanderthalensis uh, and then you have uh, Homo sapiens. So, Homo sapiens are our direct ancestors. Okay, they look of course they look like human beings. Uh, if you look at the brain size and the neuron count, okay, uh, you can see that the cortex, cortex means the uh, outer part of the brain, uh, human has the highest number of uh, uh, neurons. Okay, uh, so the brain of human being uh, it weigh about 1.2 uh, kg. Uh, I'm talking about the cerebral uh, cortex and then also it has about 16 billion uh, neurons, okay. Uh, just next to it you see this uh, African bush elephant, elephants are huge animals, right. Um, although the weight of that brain is pretty heavy, uh, almost double the size uh, of human brain. Uh, but uh, the uh, uh, the cells number of cells in the cortex is much lower it's 5.5 uh, billion neurons okay uh, and there are other uh, animals that i've also shown uh, previously like gorilla the weight of the brain is really small 377 grams and uh, uh, they have about 9.1 billion neurons in the cortex okay so this is the brain size and the number of billion, uh, number of neuronal cells that uh, uh, we have. Uh, this is another very important, uh, you know, slide. Here we have shown that how uh, basically what you are seeing is this uh, vertical lines are your uh, million of years. So number of million of years. Okay. So here you have 12 million, 12 million, uh, and uh, basically you know our uh, ancestries were we had common ancestors uh, shared by gorillas, uh, hominids, uh, which is humans, and chimpanzee, and also bonobos. Okay. So those are our uh, human uh, kind of pedigree. Uh, at around 9 million years, uh, goril uh, you can see that uh, gorillas, there is a separate, uh, you know, kind of section going to gorillas. Uh, and, you know, uh, so basically then you have western gorillas and eastern gorillas, okay. Uh, at around 8 million years ago, uh, we have uh, basically uh, kind of fork-like, uh, you know, thing going on. Uh, the top one is hominis. Hominis is your... Uh, you know, your uh, human ancestors basically. Uh, and then you have chimpanzees and uh, bonobos. Uh, in hominis, at around uh, 6 million years ago, uh, we had something called Sahelanthropus. Then you have Ardipothecus, uh, Australopithecus. Uh, so around 4 million of age, you have Australopithecus. Uh, then you have uh, around 2 million years ago, you have Homo habilis, which I showed you the picture. Okay. Then you have Homo erectus at around 1 million years ago. ago. Uh, and then you have basically Homo sapiens. So Homo sapiens are uh, basically, you can see that uh, that skull looks like a human being skull. So our immediate ancestors, the Homo sapiens, we are Homo sapiens basically. Okay. So you see how our kind of history extend from millions of years ago. This is again your timeline of evolution. As you can see from 4 million years ago, we had Austra uh, Australopithecus. Uh, and then uh, when you look at, uh, you know, your green lines uh, at around three and a half 
uh, years ago, two and a half to three, year, uh, three million years ago, you have Homo habilis uh, and Neanthralis, uh, and then basically Homo erectus, and very recently you have Homo sapiens. So our direct ancestors are Homo sapiens, which is just uh, you know uh, say around three hundred thousand years ago. Uh, this is this is your I have shown uh, how basically uh, you know the shape of the brain uh, and shape of the face has changed from Australopithecus to Homo sapiens. You can see the brain size has increased. Okay, the skull size has increased, and also the face has become smaller. Okay, so this is uh, uh, this is our how uh, we evolved over uh, millions of years. Again, these are all different uh, skulls, uh, and depending upon uh, number of millions of years, how they were before and how they are now. Okay, so definitely, uh, skull has become uh, larger and the face has become smaller. Uh, this is uh, one. Uh, uh, you know, I have taken it from Encyclopedia Britannica. Here, the right one, it is showing you uh, lower legs of gorilla. And here, left one is basically human leg. Uh, you can see that, you know, uh, it looks quite similar. Of course, uh, you know, here in gorilla, you have a bent uh, knee. Uh, and, but in, uh, here in humans, we have a straight uh, knee. Uh, we are completely bipedal. This is uh, basically lower limb starting from pelvis. The last one is human, uh, you know, modern human being. Uh, the second one is your australopath. Okay, so australopath of almost four million years ago. Uh, so this is how basically our, uh, you know, bone structure changed to, okay, bone shape. This one is one uh, really good. Uh, video I'll see if I can play it over millions here. of years before industry agriculture and civilization the world stage was set for one creature's unprecedented rise the story of humanity's evolution began about seven million years ago when the human lineage broke away from that of chimpanzees over time, an ensemble cast of over 20 early human species, or hominins, came to the fore. Most became extinct, while others might have been ancestors to today's humans. Each species exhibited varying degrees of human-like physical and behavioral traits, such as large brains, small teeth, bipedality, and tool use. These hominins fell into three major groups. Early hominins, Australopithecines, and Homo genus. Humanity's earliest relatives lived between seven and 4.4 million years ago in Africa. Having most recently shared a common ancestor with chimpanzees, they had many ape-like traits, such as a small cranial capacity. However, fossils show that some ancient hominins were also beginning to show human-like characteristics, such as small canines that were likely used more for eating and not for hunting or fighting. The next phase of hominin evolution involved primates called Australopithecines. They lived between 4.4 and 1.4 million years ago across the African continent. Like their ancient brethren, Australopithecines had some ape-like traits. However, changes in the skull, spine, and legs indicate a notable shift toward a very human-like trait, consistent bipedal locomotion. The third and current phase of human evolution involves members of the genus Homo. The earliest Homo species likely date to more than two million years ago making them a contemporary of some Australopithecines. But unlike earlier hominins, who exhibited a mosaic of ape and human-like traits, Homo species were becoming distinctly more human. Their cranial capacity was growing larger than any other hominins. They developed sophisticated stone tool technology, and they became the first to control fire. These physical and behavioral adaptations, 
along with advancements in technology, allowed some Homo species to be the first to migrate out of Africa and explore the rest of the world. While a cast of over 20 hominin species have walked this earth, only one remains. Homo sapiens, shaped by millions of years of evolution, embarked on a journey of exploration and industry its ancestors could have only dreamed. Okay, so here uh, I have taken some uh, pictures from a Smithsonian website. Smithsonian is a, uh, you know, uh, museum in Washington DC and they have amazing uh, display of, you know, reconstruction of this, uh, our ancestors uh, through, uh, you know, uh, skulls that they found. Uh, so here this is, uh, first one is your Paranthropus bosai. It's male and a reconstruction based on OH5 uh, and it is done by John Gucci. Uh, as you can see, uh, very much ape-like uh, face that we had. Uh, this is uh, Australopithecus, which I mentioned uh, starting from 4 million years ago. Uh, again, we have quite very much like, uh, uh, you know, ape-like. Uh, the third one is your Homo heidelbergensis. Uh, again, you know, uh, as you can see, uh, now we are seeing a lot more human uh, character, human uh, facial characters. Uh, the fourth one is the Homo florensis female, okay. Uh, this is uh, some of the uh, metal, this thing that they had. So this one is your eating meat uh, antelope will provide nutritious meat and marrow for Homo erectus. So this is Homo erectus female. Uh, and then you have this uh, gather around the fire. This male Homo heidelbergensis uh, uh, lives in social group and they hunt animal and share, their fo share food with each other. Okay, so this are all displayed in, uh, uh, you know, that uh, museum. Uh, here you can see male Paranthropus. Uh, uh, it's digging the, uh, you know, roots and tuber from, uh, from the soil. Uh, and the last one is basically uh, Florence's female, okay, uh, probably came from Indonesian island. Uh, this is Australopithecus again, uh, very much like, uh, you know, uh, ape. Uh, and the next one is Homo neanderthalis, adult male. Uh, another one is human erectus, female. Uh, and uh, another one is again a female, Australopithecus uh, afarensis, Lucy. Uh, you must have read about Lucy. Do read about Lucy. Uh, it came in the newspaper a few years ago. And some of the bronze uh, statues that Smithsonian has. Uh, so this is one, again, Homo erectus is carrying a, a hunt, uh, hunted animal on the back. Uh, in the on the right side, you see, uh, you know, uh, mother is showing the child, um, like she's making a hole in the height, animal height, uh, while uh, child is looking at her. Uh, this I already showed it to you guys. Uh, this is also I showed about finding the food. Uh, another really nice, uh, you know, metal statue. Uh, so these are all basically some of the statues and also the reconstruction of the face which have been built at uh, Smithsonian. Uh, I would like to show you one video uh, which is part of a Smithsonian website and I think I found it very very interesting. So I'll go ahead and uh, show you guys. Evolution involves change over time and I have here five skulls of five different fossil individuals out of about 6,000 fossil individuals that are known that help document the course of human evolution. Well, you can see from just these five, representing about two and a half million years ago to about a million years ago to near the present, that there were changes in the size of the brain case and also in the size and shape of the face. And you can see that the brain got larger over time and that the face generally got smaller over, the to over time until you get to our species where we have the largest brain and the smallest face that's tucked in underneath the brain case. So that's very different from what we have two and a half million years ago with a small brain case 
and a large sloping face. So what we see then is change over time in the physical form, in this case brain size and the size of the face. But human evolution involved not only change in the physical form of early humans up to ourselves, but also change in behavior. And so I have some of the stone tools that help show us some of the changes that occurred in the behavior uh, seen in the archaeological remains. And so we have the earliest stone technologies known back to a little bit more than two and a half million years ago. The earliest technologies consisted of basically a rock, like a cobblestone like this, which was battered, and you also have the core. And the hammerstone was brought back down on this cobble, and flake scars were made, and what flew off from the cobble itself were the sharp sta stone flakes, which were really useful for cutting meat off of animal bones, and also maybe whittling a stick, and that stick could be used to dig in the ground for roots and tubers, or maybe even deeper into the ground for water during times when things were dry. About one and a half million years ago, we see that the early humans were able to make really large flakes and to take those flakes and to strike them all the way around, creating a sharp edge all the way around. And this is a really handy tool to carry around with you for a lot of different purposes. This is the oldest known hand axe, and hand axes were around for yet another million years. Things changed pretty slowly. Well, what we see then, beginning about a half million years ago, is that the stone hand axes became smaller, and they became more and more refined, to the point where they became almost really pieces of art, really beautiful craftsmanship. And then technology kept getting smaller, as you see these fine blades, and then even the innovation of arrowheads. And arrowheads were great, of course, for killing fast and dangerous prey. And so the history of technology has been pretty much the same ever since, going from big and clunky to really small and refined. We then see over the next 100,000 years uh, up to the present, uh, innovation really picks up and we have the origin of, say, bone harpoons, which were used for, uh, for fishing, and also objects where we see symbolic markings for the first time on the bones, on antlers, and on many different kinds of objects, indicating that early humans were beginning to uh, live in a symbolic world where they used language to communicate with one another. We even have artifacts like this. This is one of the oldest known artists' palettes. Humans of our species put pigment over this flat surface, and they use that pigment and sometimes put it in their mouth to make paint or mixed it with water, and they put art onto cave walls, these fantastic painted caves that we know from Europe, from Africa, from Asia and Australia, and eventually all around the world. And that represents the origin of art. And so what we have then here is not only change in physical form, brain size, and the size of the face, but also change in behavior. And that's evolution. OK. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, this was uh, my second session. Uh, next time I will talk about uh, session three, uh, and we will start with cell biology, okay? Just to understand the basics of our cell uh, and organelles that we have in a cell, okay? Thank you so much.